Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights and Entertainment. This is episode 137, Hate the System, Not the Genie. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my loving and lovable co-host, Michelle Whalen. Aww. Valentine's is right now. I, I was going to say, is that because of Valentine's Day? That's our Valentine's themed message. That's it. We're done. <laughs> Have a good one. <laughs> good night. Try the veal. <laughs> Tip your waiter. How are you doing today, dear? Um, I'm okay. That bad, huh? <laughs> hey, look on the bright side. It's Thursday. We're oh, almost over. thank goodness. Yay, Thursday. Rough week. Aren't they all? Yeah, nowadays I guess they are. <laughs> uh, so this week <clears throat> on uh, Insights into Entertainment, on our Disney Detective, fans prefer Universal over Genie, and TikTok wants us to think Disney put a shop owner out of business. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, happy birthday to John Williams, Plus, we finally get a release date for Obi-Wan Kenobi. And we'll probably have some closing comments on the book of everyone but Boba. Uh, <laughs> and for our entertainment news this week, Dolly's paying the bills and Mickey's tribute to the monkeys. And as always, we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week and a couple of afterthoughts. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, though, I would want to invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast, you can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment. Video versions of all the network's podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things or available on, pod on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, pretty much anywhere you can get a podcast these days. I would also invite you to write in, give us your feedback, let us know how we're doing. Give us your own conventions that we can plug in our Afterthoughts segment. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com, on Twitter at insights underscore things, on Facebook at facebook.com slash insightsintothingspodcast, on Instagram at instagram.com slash insightsintothings, or links to all those and much more are available on our official website at insightsintothings.com. Are we ready? Sure. Here we go. Go for Disney Detective. So our first story comes from InsideTheMagic.net, and it was guests hate Disney Genie and actually prefer Universal's costly express pass so we've talked obviously many times about the free fast pass system that disney previously used which is no more so disney has re uh disney revealed its new disney genie and lightning lane system into the disney parks last year which has come to some criticism disney genie is free but for the extra charge guests can upgrade to genie plus which allows them uh, other access to reservation systems, as well as the option to purchase individual lightning lanes for rides, essentially letting them pay to skip the, pay the standby queues. The new system has been met with a lot of frustration and criticism from new and longtime Disney guests and fans. A recent post in Reddit highlighted this issue, and it also showed that most Disney guests online would prefer a system more like Universal Studios. So the question posted uh, in Reddit asked, if you had a choice in Disney when it came to skipping lines, would you prefer an express similar to Universal's pay one time higher fee but skip all the lines 
or stick with Genie Plus? And one answer that seemed to be echoed by others was, I have been reading various reviews of Lightning Lane Genie Plus and all the scheduling and planning that goes behind it, and quite frankly, I think I'd rather purchase an Express Pass like Universal. I used to think Universal's Express Pass was a lot of money, but now compared to Genie Plus, it seems worth it. Another user had commented, I would absolutely pay for a Universal Express at Disney if it was available. I dislike having to compete with others for the exact time and availability with Genie Plus and FastPass. I don't want to plan my entire day at 7 a.m. or 60 days out. It would be worth it to me to explore the park how I want and ride all the rides I want. This user agreed, saying, Universal. Way fewer people would purchase, thereby not affecting the standby line neg negatively. Right now, so many people are buying Genie Plus that it kills the standby. It's a lose-lose for everyone except Disney. And another user commented, Universal, I hated planning my day around when I had a lightning lane pass. And this user agreed as well, saying that Universal Express Pass is a game changer. My family did it once, and now we don't do it without it. Even though you pay so much more, the benefits save you so much time. Disney Genie Plus and Lightning Lanes were released last year to some criticism and frustration, leaving some guests feeling confused by the service. In theory, this paid service should enhance guests' experience at the parks, but in practice, it seems to just be an expensive itinerary planner for some, while others love it. These paid services allow guests to skip lines for a price, meaning Disney now has a financial incentive to have longer lines. At Disney World, for $15 per day per guest, you can skip the long standby queue by making a Lightning Lane reservation, their new Fast Pass, and return at that time. Each park, however, there are only two attractions that guests would need to purchase a separate Lightning Lane ticket for if they wanted to skip those lines, and that would be the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train and Space Mountain in Magic Kingdom, Remy's Ratatouille Adventure and Frozen Ever After in Epcot, Star Wars Rise of the Resistance and Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railroad uh, Railway in Hollywood Studios, and then Avatar Flight of Passage and Expedition Everest in Animal Kingdom. Universal Studios Orlando has a similar pass, but it works slightly different than Disney's. The Universal Pass starts at $79.99 and allows guests to skip the lines on rides and attractions. Guests have the option to upgrade to an Express Pass, which allows unlimited skips for all participating rides and attractions, and that starts at $109.99. The Express Pass, however, can increase dramatically uh, depending on the day and time of year. And the person that wrote the article had said they have seen it at some points during the summer months cost up to $200 for a single day. And they make a very interesting point in this article that Disney is now incentivized to have lines mm -hmm. because they can make money off it. And that's an angle we actually hadn't really talked about right. up until this point here. Right, because we have always said you don't want to have a line. If you are a theme park owner, where are you making your extra money? Like, okay, you already got the money for them getting in the park. You already, you know, got that. But if they're standing on line waiting three hours for a ride, they're not buying food. They're not buying merchandise. They're not buying snacks. Right. Yeah. I mean, you lose out on concessions there, but mm -hmm. you know, if Disney's only charging 15 bucks. It's certainly not going to make that up. Right. I mean, I think a soda costs $15 at Disney now. <laughs> oh, yeah. A soda and a pretzel is probably like 15 bucks. So, yeah, $15. You know, so isn't really so now since they've already gone with flex pricing for park tickets, right? Based on usage in the park mm -hmm. and, and volume in the park, right? I could totally see them going Universal's method with this. Say, all right, 
15's your base entry. Oh, well, we're busy today, so it's not going to be 30 or it's going to be 50. Well, or... and that's the thing is because the $15 is just to have Genie Plus because right. regular Genie is free. Now Which is I have really worthless. I mean, regular genie is just right, and an that's the thing that is I haven't wait times right, and I haven't really heard anybody do a hey. I just went to the park with just regular genie. This is what you know. Everybody's doing all right. I paid my fifteen dollars and tried it out for for the day. And if you're an annual pass holder, you still have to pay the fifteen dollars right. a day. It's right. not even yeah. something where it's a perk and and it's included if you have an annual pass. Now, granted, you can decide, you know, so if you're going for four days, you can decide, well, I only want Genie Plus for one day. You don't have to do it for your entire stay, which. Right. It's not attached to your ticket. Right. So I guess in that respect, it's not so bad because then you could say, all right, we're just going to splurge the one day and try it. Right. You know, and everything else is kind of a we'll just see what we can get on type day. But then. I don't think you have to have Genie Plus in order to do the lightning lanes because I think that's, again, I'm not 100% sure because we haven't been in a while and we haven't really. Nor do we plan on going for a while. (laughs) So I kind of feel bad when like friends of mine have asked and I'm like, I don't know. You got to Google it. I really don't know. But with the lightning lane, it's not a set price. Right. The lightning lane does surge. So that does go up. So you could be paying twenty dollars to go on just right. one ride, or you know anywhere from fifteen to to twenty five well, or something. The bottom so. line here is there are a lot of people that are very unhappy mm-hmm. with this. Absolutely, very unhappy with these changes. And just for from a personal standpoint, we haven't been down. We're not going down anytime soon, and we've finalized the sale of our DVC membership too. Yeah. So. And this is really coming from a diehard Disney family that, you know, I've been down there, I don't know, we've been together 18 years now. Has it been that long? Yeah, about that long. How old is the child? Well, she's 15. Right, and we were together for about three years before that. Oh, okay. Wow. So we've been together. You put up with me for 18 <laughs> years now. Holy crap. Do I get and a refund? No. <laughs> in those 18 years, <laughs> we've, we've gone. been the Disney. I've been the Disney, I think, 20 times now, 21 times, because there was a number of times we went multiple yeah, times Yeah, there a were year. a couple of years when we went twice. We, we, I think one time we went three, three times. times. Every time you maybe buy a season pass, we went three times to get our money's worth out of it, which I'm not really sure how the math works on that, but okay. <laughs> totally um, works. So- so we're a family that in, in 18 years, we've gone down over 20 times. Right. And now we're not going down because of this. That's the story that Disney needs to hear and understand. Because And I'm sure we're not the only not one. It is not unique to us. Right. There are thousands of people. Mm-hmm. So Disney needs to think how much money they're losing now, mm-hmm. nickel and diming people and pissing people off. Yeah. Because we would go down and it would cost us on average... Three to five grand, depending on how much memorabilia, how much, how many toys I bought down there, collectibles. Right. right. But anywhere from three to five grand. Mm-hmm. You know, you were, we were easily two grand in for tickets and and hotel and, and whatever mm-hmm. when we weren't using the DVC. Right. You multiply that times 20, and that's that much money that Disney's losing on one family. Mm-hmm. It's stupid. It's bad business. Yeah. Bad business. Speaking of bad business... What else is Disney allegedly doing wrong? So from the daily dot dot com, uh, thanks, Disney, for putting me out of business um, in a viral TikTok. Um, Michael Manzella, 37, showed a storefront with a sign stating that the shop would be closing after 37 years of business due to filming in the French Quarter of New Orleans. The sign states Thanks, Disney and NOLA Film Office, for putting me out of business out of 37 years at this location. The sign continues, I survived Katrina, the BP oil spill, the building next door collapsing, mandatory COVID closure, to just name a few. And who would believe Mickey Mouse would take me down? 
Now, during the recording, a person behind the camera reads the sign out loud, and then someone faintly says, F Mickey in the background. So it's unclear who made the statement. But by Thursday, the video had more than 118,000 views. Despite what the note said, people weren't actually buying the story. One user commented, When film companies film in an area with stores or restaurants, they normally pay them anywhere from $4,000 to $10,000 a day. So that owner is lying. Another user said, That is total BS. Disney compensates businesses to close for the time that they are filming. So it seems like this shop was already going downhill for a while, somebody said. On the other hand, some felt that this might have been the best move if the store wasn't receiving much business. One user stated, sounds like they weren't making any money. And another user commented, judging by the clothes in the window, it's not Mickey's fault. (laughs) In the video, there are several items such as reading glasses, a watch, and a few pieces of don't uh, donated, uh, I'm sorry, clothing, including a straw hat that and some shirts that one might consider outdated. So according to NOLA.com, Disney is scheduled to film this year in New Orleans for the reboot of the horror comedy film The Haunted Mansion, which debuted in 2003, and the original, which starred Eddie Murphy. So the new movie, with the working title Joyride, started filming on January 27th. I'd love to know exactly why they're going out of business. Right. and Because if Disney's coming in the film, you know at most they'll film for a couple of days on location. Right. Where that store is going to have to be closed down for filming. Right. And even if they're not compensated, which you know they will be. Absolutely. What store can't afford to close down business for two or three days? If, they've, if you've gone through all the hardships that they say they've gone mm-hmm. through. Right. I think it it was totally a ploy to, you know, get somebody to to feel bad. Right. (laughs) So is this this them trying to get locals there to to give them business because they're they've got they weren't doing it because they're not doing very well? (laughs) Is this them trying to set up to sue Disney? Like I'd be curious to see where this one goes here. Yeah. It's it's interesting to see as as much as I rag on Disney, mm-hmm. and and justifiably so, Disney is not the cause of everybody's woes, even right. if you want to make it out to be. Right. Exactly. So, But that was all we had for our Disney detective this week. Mm-hmm. We will be back in a minute. As soon as I find my mouse, I don't know where it went. I got too many screens. There it is. Be, <laughs> we'll be back in a minute uh, with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. If I had a thing over here, I can... I, I, you need to run the board from now on. That's all. Okay. All right. Anyway, in our tale stream from the edge of the galaxy this week, it's pure magic celebrating John Williams and his music. Again, I lost my mouse. Where did my mouse go? There it is. Okay. <laughs> Do we need to get a cat in here to I help need you? a bigger mouse icon. Oh, uh, okay. Anyway. Anyway, Star Wars and many of the movies we love would not be the same without John Williams. With a body of work that includes the scores for the nine film Star Wars saga, Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Indiana Jones, and Jurassic Park, to name but a few, 
William's compositions are embedded in our memories and our lives. From a dorsal fin emerging out of beach waters, to Luke Skywalker gazing longingly at setting twin, twin suns, to the goosebump inducing sight of a towering Brachiosaurus, his music connects us to characters and worlds in ways that touch us deep down. It's romantic, stirring, gorgeous to imagine these scenes in films without his music is near impossible. Celebrating the legacy of, compo of the composers... No, let's try that one again. That's a completely wrong line. Celebrating the legendary composer's 90th birthday, StarWars.com spoke with those who followed Williams in writing scores for Star Wars. Michael Giacchino... Ludwig Göransson, John Powell, and Kevin Kiner about his influence on film and their lives. Michael Giacchino, who composed the score for Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, says to say that John Williams has been an inspiration to myself or any contemporary film composer would be the greatest understatement. It's too difficult to put into words how important his work has been to all of us in this business. Listening to John's music is not only a masterclass in film composing and storytelling, but John is an example of someone who has taken his talent and passion to transform other parts of the music world. In particular, his work in the classical arena that not only gave us pieces outside of film music, but his time at the Boston Pops has helped open the door for the acceptance of film music in the concert world, something for which I'm very grateful. Ludwig Göransson, who composed the scores for The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba, says the first time I heard John Williams, I was at home by my TV in our living room. I must have been around seven when I begged my parents to let me watch Jaws with them. During the more visceral, scary parts of the movie, my dad would cover my eyes. Not being able to see what was happening on the screen, I just listened to the sound. That intense music had an extreme effect on me. The Jaws I created in my head was scarier than what was happening on screen. Those fantasies stayed with me for a long time. John Powell, who composed the score for Solo, a Star Wars story, says, Truthfully, my first exposure to John Williams was probably Fiddler on the Roof. It clearly cemented my love of giant Hollywood orchestration and probably made me aware of the power of music in storytelling. But then I also remember becoming abnormally fascinated by the title music to Time Tunnel. He says, I know these seem a little obscure compared with what we know him for, but it speaks volumes that he's always been able to excite me with that incredible rhythmic use of orchestra the way I'm roused as it connects to the story, and how a plot seems to suddenly move forward when his music is under it. And this is all before I, ever, I was ever aware of film composers. And finally, Kevin Kiner, who has composed most of the music for the animated series Clone Wars, Rebels, and Bad Batch, says the first time I remember hearing John Williams' score was watching Star Wars in Westwood, California, where I was attending UCLA. I remember thinking, how does he make that sound? That and the Superman score started me on a lifelong quest to unravel his secrets and find my own path to making my own mysteriously wonderful sound. And I have to say, as a kid, I did have access to videotape versions or the, the laser disc versions of the movies, all I had, and this was probably just, well, it was mostly Re Return of the Jedi. It was an audio recording. Okay. That my cousin had made for me of the movie. Okay. And I would sit there and listen to the audio recording. And it was the dialogue and the music and everything. Okay. okay. But you didn't, not seeing anything it, you you very quickly realize the music told the story. Mm -hmm. The music, his music is like a narrator. Absolutely. 
It sets the pace for the movie. Mm-hmm. It tells you when a scene changes. It sets the the environment. I mean, you can feel the the, the um, forest scenes, for instance. Mm-hmm. You didn't need to see trees. You could hear it just in the score that he wrote for it. Mm-hmm. It was it was one of the most incredible experiences. And even now, you know, we play. Uh, uh, scores and, and various orchestral pieces on our, our home smart speakers. And I can listen to the opening score of any of the Star Wars movies and within 30 seconds, because there's subtle differences in each of them. It's the main score, mm-hmm. but there there's differences from movie to movie. I can tell you which movie it is. And as it progresses through the score, I can tell you what scene it is, where the dialogue comes in. And it's that's how powerful his music is. And what's also funny is that when we listen to those channels, not necessarily it being a Star Wars channel, 80% of the movie or 80% of the songs are John Williams songs because mm-hmm. not only has he done all of Star Wars and all of Indiana Jones and most of Harry Potter yep. and, you know, all of these iconic... He's incredibly Movies. prolific mm-hmm. in the impact that he's had on pop culture and music across various genres. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's worth noting that, you know, I only read excerpts of the interviews. Um, I would recommend going to the StarWars.com website to actually read mm-hmm. the full interviews because there's there, there's a lot more to them. Mm-hmm. Um, but happy birthday to to John Wayne's 90 years 90 old. 90 years old. God bless. Mm-hmm. Also this week in uh, Star Wars news, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi gets a debut date. So one of the greatest Jedi ever is back for a new mission. Obi-Wan Kenobi, the new limited series from Lucasfilm, will debut May 25th exclusively on Disney+. Plus. The series stars Ewan McGregor reprising his role as the iconic Jedi Master. The story begins ten years after the dramatic events of Star Wars Revenge of the Sith, in which Obi-Wan Kenobi faced his greatest defeat, the downfall and corruption of his best friend and Jedi apprentice, Anakin Skywalker, who turned to the dark side and became the evil Sith Lord Darth Vader. No spoilers, though, in case you haven't seen it. If you haven't seen it now, <laughs> you're like 40-something years late. <laughs> the series also marks the return of Hayden Christensen in the role of Darth Vader. Now, the other thing that's worth uh, noting is that we've only gotten a teaser trailer mm-hmm. so far out of this. And it was less um, shots from the – it was a mix of art. A couple of shots from the series and interviews. So it didn't really show you much of what right. was happening in the show. Right. Uh, so we're everyone's eagerly anticipating the teaser trailer, the actual full trailer mm-hmm. to show up. Right. Speculation is it'll drop during the Super Bowl this weekend. Okay. So one more reason to watch the Super Bowl. Okay. I didn't have enough already, so. Yeah, I didn't really have any. <laughs> yeah, so. No boxes. <laughs> yeah, me neither. So. Anyway, that's all we had for our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. We'll be back in a minute after a quick break with our Entertainment News of the Week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com.
go for entertainment news. So leave it to Dolly Parton to deliver the good news of the day. From CNN.com, it seems that the legendary singer's theme park, Dollywood, will begin paying full college tuition for all employees who choose to go. The company will also cover miscellaneous fees and textbooks. The education perk is available to employees starting on their very first day of work and will be available to all seasonal, part-time, and full-time employees. The tuition coverage starts February 24th. Dollywood has a reputation for caring for its employees. Along with the new tuition benefit, employees receive access to the Dollywood Family Health Care Center and provide free meals for every working shift. They uh, also have an apprentice and leadership training program, and the park also pays a portion of child care costs for employees who need child care while they're at work. I think that is more good news. Absolutely. Now, she, granted, she's definitely become like a national treasure. She's, <laughs> and, she's taken over for Betty White at this point. Yeah, yeah. You know, and even, you know, when COVID, you know, she was putting funding in, yep. you know, for for vaccinations and, and stuff. And she has a whole book program for kids. And so this is just like another yeah, thing. And that, granted, she's not, it's not the first company to pay college tuition. Right, right. But on top of all the other things, mm-hmm. and in light of the conditions that other amusement theme park employees are facing nowadays, mm-hmm. it's nice that she's a, a shining example of how Absolutely. to do it. Absolutely. Right. Like, even when, you know, when I worked in the theme park industry back in the day, I had to pay for my own lunch. I wasn't given, you know, a, a free lunch every. Pfft, you know, every every time I, I worked, a, you know, granted, I wasn't paying the same price as sure. guests yeah, were dis- going. You get an employee discount. I was getting an employee that. discount, but still, you know, I still had to pay. So if I was working a five-day work week. And unlike some theme parks, I'm sure Dollywood doesn't grow a chunk of their own food that they can serve to their employees. <laughs> Probably not. At no cost. Yeah. That, that would be a place I, I that, that I would want to go to. Just... To you know, to say I've I've been that in the Holy Land experience, but that we can't do that. Well, that one close. That we missed that one. We had that opportunity well, so many times. We better get the Dollywood before they close. I bite your tongue. They better not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what we'll do this summer. We'll go to Dollywood. Well, one thing that is going to be closing out is. A farewell tour for the monkeys. Yeah, so from Rollingstone.com, it seems that Mickey Dolenz is going to honor his departed monkeys bandmates with a special tour. So Mickey Dolenz is going to uh, honor uh, bandmates Michael Nesmith, Peter Tork, and Davy Jones with a special tour. He's billing it as Mickey Dolenz Celebrates the Monkey, and it kicks off in April. He said, I felt it was very important to gather the fans properly uh, and properly celebrate the lives of Davey, Mike, and Peter. People have been contacting me, requesting that I honor them in a way where the extraordinary impact of the monkeys can be properly acknowledged. We sent such a great, we spent such a great deal of time together. They were like my brothers and I want to share some of the great joy we had together. Dolan's will be backed by a seven piece band for the show and will play all of the monkeys hits in addition to signature songs by all three of his former bandmates, including Nesmith's different drum and Papa Jean's blues Torque's for Pete's sake. And can you dig it? And Jones's look out here. Com- here comes tomorrow and Valerie. He's also going to share stories from his time in the group and show unseen images from his personal archives. Dolan's is the voice behind many of the group's most favorite songs, include most famous songs, including Last Train to Clarksville, I'm a Believer, and Pleasant Valley Sunday. He is also the only monkey to participate in every single reunion project the band ever attempted, with the exception of a brief 1986 Australian tour that featured just Jones and Torque. He said, I never resented being known as a monkey. 
Uh, he had told Rolling Stone last year, your career is like a train that takes an enormous amount of inertia to get it going. When it finally gets going, some people try to stop the train. They are the people that you see in concert and they go, I'm not going to sing any of my old hits. I'm going to change my entire image. And then they try and they stop the train. Very seldom does that happen. It's virtually impossible and you piss off the fans. Dolan spent last year in an extensive Monkees farewell tour with Michael Nesmith that wrapped up just 26 days before he had died from heart failure. He said, I found out a couple of days ago that he was going into hospice. He had told Rolling Stone just a few hours after the news broke. That's what I and I knew that's what it meant. I had my moment then and I let go. It's just good to know that he passed peacefully. Yeah, I mean, it's nice that he's doing it uh, in in memory of his mm-hmm. bandmates. It's it's sad that he's the last one. He's kind of stuck with the job of doing that. Sort yeah. Of thing. Well, I did happen to look up some of the tour dates. So he's actually on tour starting like next month up until the summer, but with different bands kind okay. of scattered throughout. And then he kind of does a chunk in April where it's just this monkey's tribute. Oh, so okay, okay. so he's actually touring, you know, pretty much from, like I said, from now until June. Um, he's going to be in Red Bank, which is kind of close to here. Um, and then he's going to be in Lancaster. That's as close as he's going to come to to our area. Okay. Um, so I'm sure some of these other shows will be, you know, some of the the monkey stuff, but not just specifically right. the the tribute show. Right. So yeah, I remember a good good chunk of my childhood was was watching and listening yep. to monkeys. Mine, mine too. So so all right. Well, that was all we had for our entertainment news. We'll yep. be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Mm-hmm. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick this week is a uh, show that is on Netflix. It is called Archive 81, and it is about an archivist that takes a job restoring damaged videotapes and gets pulled into the vortex of a mystery involving the missing director and a demonic cult. It's an intriguing blend of horror and noir, and Archive 81's offers an addictive supernatural thrill that are haunting in the best way. And it's also, uh, Archive 81 happens to be based on a podcast uh, that's uh, kind of talks about lost, uh, found footage of horror things and, and whatnot. So they kind of loosely based it. Um, so it's kind of interesting because the story takes place partially in the present time frame and also back in 1995 uh, and 94. Uh, and there's all this, you know, back and forth and just very weird, supernaturally kind of stuff. Kind of reminded me a little bit of Midnight Mass with the freakiness uh, of things. I ended up binging it over a weekend, and I'm not usually one to binge stuff. Usually I like to take my time because I know once I'm done, I'm done. But this was one where it was just kind of like, okay, where are they going with this? And and they did kind of end it with a bit of a cliffhanger, so they definitely could do a second season, but if they don't, you could just kind of see it as a, oh, okay, this is weird and freaky, and it has those little jump scares that you expect a horror show to do, but then there are certain things where you're like, I didn't see that coming, and, you know, so if you're into that type of genre, very cool, uh, you know, eight-episode show to, to watch. All right, good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week is a documentary, I guess it's kind of a documentary, Engineering Catastrophes. Experts, uh, it airs on Science Channel, by the way. Uh, Experts look at engineering blunders that have either caused catastrophes or are disasters waiting to happen. They use cutting-edge technology to examine what went wrong and to figure out if it can be fixed. Over the course of five seasons, they explore bridge collapses, building collapses, catastrophic fires, 
railroad accidents, construction mishaps, natural disasters, and more. Each episode is a lesson in engineering, science, and planning. While some of these disasters are devastatingly fatal and certainly financially costly, each of them contributed in some positive way to make engineering science safer in the long run. Most people watch these shows, these types of shows, for the wow factor of a building collapsing or a massive explosion. I tend to watch these to gain an appreciation for just how difficult it is to make things in our modern world function. We tend to take for granted the bridges, highways, railways, and other infrastructure that support our way of life until something disrupts it. I also enjoy seeing how engineers can sift through a giant pile of rubble, determine exactly what caused the issue, and put measures in place to prevent disasters from happening again in the future. To me, it's a real poignant way of illustrating that we learn more from our failures than from our successes. That is Engineering Catastrophes on the Science Channel. And we'll be right back with our afterthoughts. So, we've been talking about these. Let's plug them real quick. Sure. So, we have uh, NerdFest. <laughs> Gotta love that. Which is February 27th. Uh, it is at the Holiday Inn in Swedesboro. Uh, it's just the one day from 10 to 4. Admission is $5. Kids 12 and under are free with a paying adult. And then, of course, our favorite... Zolocon. That will be March 4th and, I'm sorry, March 5th and 6th in Warminster, uh, Pennsylvania. Admission on Saturday is $15. Kids are five. And then on Sunday, general admission is $10 and kids are free. All righty. Before we go, I do want to once again implore our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find uh, audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Entertainment. Video versions of all of our podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things. We're available on Pandora, Castro, Stitcher, Podbean, Buzzsprout, and any place you can get a podcast. I would also invite you to write in, give us your feedback, give us your conventions you'd like us to plug. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter at twitter.com backslash insights underscore things. We do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. You can find all of our past shows on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things or you can find all this and much more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com and that's it another one in the books have a good week everyone bye bye